So welcome everyone. I'm so glad everyone was able to join us today. Um, we are celebrating inclusive employment here at North Star Academy. We're so pleased to have you join us to celebrate uh, National Disemployment Disability Employment Awareness Month, excuse me. And, and thank you very much for taking the time out of your day to be here. Um, just a couple of housekeeping things before we get started. Uh, again, just a notice that we are recording this webinar and wanted to make sure that I notified you of that. Second of all, um, we're gonna ask that everyone who participates keeps their cameras off and their microphones muted. Um, and this will just enable fuller participation by everyone. Be aware that we do have chat enabled on this webinar. So if you have any questions or comments, we absolutely welcome those. And we will be addressing those questions at the end, uh, again, to facilitate fuller group communication and participation. So thank you again, everyone, for being here. Today is a day of celebration. We're so glad to have everyone here. Uh, we have a lot to celebrate in the disability rights community. This year marks the 30th anniversary of the Americans with Disabilities Act. And this really brings us to reflect on a broader trend that is happening in our community. Sometimes when we think about disabilities employment, some of the first things that come to folks' minds are that we need to think about ways that we can accommodate and support individuals who maybe work a little bit differently or face different challenges. But today, I would like to celebrate some of the changes that we have made on a community level because those things are absolutely critical to opening doors for people who need to take advantages of different ways of learning and functioning at work. I like to compare this to the differences between the things that people do on a daily basis to make their lives run smoothly and the importance of a community infrastructure. So I just like to invite everybody for a moment to think back about the basic things you did to get your day started off well. Looks like everybody got up this morning and took shower, Maybe you didn't drive to work because of the current pandemic, but you were able to boot up your computer and log on to Zoom and come join us. All of those things you did because you have excellent personal habits. And maybe you have some things that help you stay on track like a schedule or an alarm, or maybe a cheat sheet of how to use Zoom. And all of those things are great that you do to maximize your participation in your world. But let me draw attention to the importance of the infrastructure that has to exist for you to be able to exercise your positive habits. If the internet access isn't strong where you live, you wouldn't be able to participate with us. If you didn't have clean, fresh water piped to your house, those hygiene steps may have been a little bit tougher. If your cell phone didn't connect with a satellite or your old school alarm clock didn't connect with the grid, setting it so that you would get up this morning at the right time wouldn't really work out so well. So when we think about disability employment and access for people of all abilities, we need to remember it's not just about changes that individuals can make in their lives and ways we can support those changes. It's about how we have to change as a community and how we have to build the infrastructure in our communities and our thinking and in our ways of working that enables everyone to do the things they need to do in their lives to truly have access to employment. One of the, the key landmark changes that happened was the Americans with Disabilities Act that happened 30 years ago. And we have seen the, the infrastructure changes that that put in place play out over the last 30 years. And we have seen changes and growth in access to employment because of the provisions of this act. But I would invite you today to celebrate those changes and those accomplishments and also to imagine a world envisioning what the next 30 years could bring. Are we going to be where we are now or are we going to see some substantive change and a whole new layer of infrastructure to develop? This is an exciting time to be having this conversation. 
because as we all know, the last six to nine months have brought an incredible amount of change and opportunity to our world. We face the challenge of a global pandemic and we have all have to had to change our ways of working. Maybe you've noticed my mask. School is in session. Students are here and we're continuing on with our work at North Star Academy. As I'm sure those of you who are listening and watching are also finding new ways to continue with your life. What we have seen the business community do in the last, particularly in the US, the last six months has been to implement the kinds of access and system-wide uh, opportunities that for so long have been denied to people with disabilities. For so long, people applying to jobs have been told, oh, it's not possible to reshape the way this job could be done because that would just be too difficult or the technology is not in place or the person-to-person -person interaction on the job is just too important. There's no way you could do this job from home or with an assistive technology device or there's no way we could reshape these job duties because they're just too critical the way they are. But one of the things that the COVID pandemic has proven is that when we really need to, we are capable of immense creativity and worldwide change. We all of us have that power and capacity. And I invite you and I challenge you and I thank you for being part of the conversation that's going to critically reflect and consider how if we had the same level of motivation to build an inclusive workforce, how we could sustain some of the methods and strategies that we've used recently in our communities. How could we sustain those over time so that our workforce becomes more inclusive? Today, we have two fantastic speakers who are going to share their experience and expertise. And we're really going to focus on the specific hows of how do we make this happen? We know it's possible in a lot of ways in many different places and in many different communities, we're doing this. So how do we make this possible across the board? And more specifically, if you're participating in this webinar, how do you look at your own organization and your own life to say, what are my next steps? What exactly do I do? What strategies do I use? So I'm just gonna give you a little bit of a preview of what our speakers will be addressing. If you're working at an organization, you may be saying, we're trying to hire right now, but we don't have applicants or candidates that are facing certain challenges. How do we tap into groups who have been under recruited? Before the pandemic hit, we were facing very low unemployment, which was great. But what that also meant that recruiting strategies were really critical to making sure we were fulfilling the positions in our organizations with the kind of quality team members that we needed to pursue our missions. So one of the strategies we're gonna talk about today is how do you go about building a pipeline of these organizations? How do you go about building a pipeline to these candidates by using community organizations who are really experts in working with people from all different backgrounds and with all different challenges and skills to enter into the workforce? Secondly, we're gonna talk about how you can start, how can you initiate a relationship with these prospective employees by using strategies that at Northstar, we like to call them globally work experiences or work-based learning. Um, specifically, sometimes we might talk about job shadowing or internships. And I also like to spotlight the importance of employing someone for the first time. So maybe a short-term first-time employment experience. Secondly, you may look within your organization and ask yourself, well, well, how do I bring this priority that's so valuable to me? How do I bring that to the, uh, to the importance and drive a sense of, of priority and motivation to both line managers who might be working directly with these employees and also to leadership within that organization? And we're gonna talk a little bit about the role of diversity training and how that can really help people within an organization become comfortable and open and become creative thinkers about how to make this work. We're also going to talk about how drawing attention to the best practices that you may already have in place for universal inclusion can really help people think about how to extend those inclusive strategies and ways of working to facilitate participation by all. 
So now I'm gonna turn the floor over to Bob Lancaster. And I'm so happy to have him here. Um, he has worked for many years at the Federal Reserve Bank in Richmond and helped start the employee resource group that has promoted better inclusive strategies at that bank. And they have also been a partner with North Star Academy. So thank you very much for supporting that relationship. Also, Bob is currently the chair of Virginia Ability, which is a business network of all different businesses of different sizes in our community um, that is promoting inclusive employment. So thank you for being with us, Bob. Hey, thank you, Holly. I, I'm honored to be participating in um, your star and ours in this in celebrating inclusion employment web webinar. You know, I have to start by saying, you know, I miss the in-person um, interaction and, and uh, especially presenting. But uh, it was kind of nice that, you know, I could throw on a dress shirt and a sport coat and I, you know, I've got shorts and my slippers on. So I'll just, you know, kind of leave it at that. But it's, uh, it's you know, it is, it's, it's different, um, you know, but uh, uh, we have to make ourselves comfortable. So before I jump in, I want to get you in the right mindset. Um, uh, some of the things we're going to be talking about. And I want to start with an exercise in neocortex and thalamus which are the areas of the brain that controls our imagination. Um, and, and, you know, we're, we're starting with this um, sort of theme here about imagine a world. And I want you to just uh, for a minute, imagine a world and um, think about what, you know, what comes to mind. I, I think if obviously what, what we're dealing with today has a lot to, um, a lot to do with how you respond to imagine a world, a world with no pandemics, a world with no civil or social unrest, a world that is uh, not divisive, but inclusive. Um, and something interesting, I did a little research on imagination and it, it, imagination shapes the way we see our reality and therefore affects uh, our expectations and hopes, uh, our actions and behaviors. And if we imagine good things, right, just think about how this will affect your actions and behaviors. And that's what we're going to talk a lot about today. So let's imagine a world that will help shape the way we want to see reality, the way we want people to see the ability and not the disability. So imagine a world where people with disabilities and their potential are understood. Imagine a world where barriers to employment disappear and stronger personal connections are developed, a diversity of perspectives are celebrated, and inclusive company cultures are valued. So you go to the next slide, thanks. So I'm gonna to talk to you about how you can make change happen from within your organization, as well as in your community. Um, you know, if you're participating today, you, you already know the why. Uh, so we're going we're gonna to focus really on what you can do to make change happen. Um, um, and before I, uh, before I introduce my, my daughter to you, um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about myself. Uh, I think that'll, that'll help um, so you know, you know where, I'm, where I'm coming from because I'm going to wear a lot of different hats. So first off, I'm the father of a daughter with Down syndrome. It's my daughter, Sarah. Um, I have almost 25 years with the Federal Reserve, serving in very diverse business and IT leadership roles, um, but was fortunate enough to um, uh, um, be involved in founding our, uh, one of our employee resource groups. They've been in place for a few years, but I founded Ability Beyond the Label in um, 2010. So I'm gonna be talking to you about some of that experience. I have really spent the past 26 years learning about disabilities. My daughter's gonna turn 26 in November. And um, I think the biggest thing is the unique characteristics and the talents in every individual. Um, and I have to admit that a lot of that is overcoming uh, my own unconscious bias. Um, you know, when, when I think back to my experience, you know, I grew up at a time where in elementary school, the, um, the students with disabilities, uh, those that we called mentally retarded, would be very separate uh, from, you know, not only our classrooms, but when we would go to lunch, you'd, you'd see them walk by on a very different schedule. So while 
you know, I, I, I'm certainly not, um, uh, you know, my focus on disability is, is very different, but those unconscious biases still, still come to play. Even when I see my daughter and around some of her friends, um, you know, I, that bias will kick in. Um, and so it's something we just have to be mindful of and we have to practice. Um, I've served on the board, uh, as Holly mentioned, of Virginia Ability since 2016 and was previously on the board of the Down Syndrome Association for about nine years. And um, so I, I represent a dad, a hiring manager, organizational leadership, uh, nonprofit leadership, uh, an advocate, and I'm gonna be speaking to you wearing all of those different hats today and hopefully bring, uh, bring some perspectives that um, are new, you haven't heard, um, you know, that you'll be able to take away from this webinar. So that is my daughter. Um, I'm gonna share a quick story <laughs> before I uh, kind of step you through her journey. But we go on walks together and uh, she goes begrudgingly. She loves to do the treadmill and the elliptical. Um, she does it every day. She sets her timer for 30 minutes. She hates to go outside for walks. Uh, and in the summer, it's impossible because she hates to sweat. Um, so, you know, every now and then I'll, you know, at least several times a week, I'm like, we're going for a walk. So she goes begrudgingly. So we're out on our walk and, and she goes, she said, dad, why am I different? Why am I so different? And I thought, oh, this is just a great moment, you know, um, to really be able to talk about her uniqueness and, and, uh, and her Down syndrome. So I started in, I said, you know, God, all, God made us all uh, unique. He created everyone with special gifts. Um, and those are the, you know, the talents that you have. And she, she obviously goes, man, no, that's not what I'm talking about. And, and I looked at her and said, well, I said, well, how do you mean different? And she goes, you know, I'm different. She goes, you know, the other day, I, I you know, I usually don't like to go on walks. Um, you know, I complain the whole time. And today I'm just all happy. I'm excited to be here. I'm excited to go on a walk with you. And I was like, oh, that's, that's what you mean by different. Um, and, you know, so I said, you know, we all have good days, good days and bad days. Um, I said, do you remember at work, you know, you would have bad days and you have to bring your whole self to work. Um, you have to work through those bad, bad days because, you know, your, your employer wants you to always have a good day and be productive, but sometimes you just have to work through that. And, um, you know, the, uh, I was, I love this story, but I was trying to, think about how this really ties into the conversation. And, um, you know, it just struck me that people with disabilities have such a unique perspective because of how they've grown up in the world. And, um, you know, that's what makes them valuable to an organization. That's what we need to focus on um, to, to employers. And I'm gonna talk a minute about, you know, the, the journey that, you know, the long way we have to go with employers, but, um, you know, that's really what we have to focus on. We have to focus on their abilities, the unique gifts and talents and the perspectives that they bring to the job. So Sarah's journey, she graduated high school in 2014. She actually went to my alma mater, um, Douglas South Hall Freeman. And um, she graduated from high school with no employment hopes. Um, you know, we did the job visits. We kept her in high school for, I think, uh, two, two years beyond, uh, you know, normal graduation, um, just because there were some opportunities for her to work at the school, do some job site visits. But really, by the time she graduated, we had no employment hopes. And uh, I was encouraged uh, by a friend uh, of mine to enroll her into VCU's ACE and College program. And we knew there were some programs out there, especially for individuals with intellectual disabilities, but we really didn't think she was at all prepared uh, to go to college. And uh, we were, you know, we were encouraged. We when enrolled her, said, no, she'll be fine, just enroll her. And it was the uh, most phenomenal experience of her life. She uh, fully participated as a, a college student. She was on campus most of the day. She worked um, in between classes. She had a, a student um, uh, education coach that went to classes with her and helped her, but she was you know, part of college. And um, 
and and absolutely loved it. She was, as, as most of us probably remember, she was, you know, uh, when we graduated college, it was a sad time. But two weeks before she graduated from college, uh, she applied for, interviewed for, and landed her first job at Discovery Village. Um, she'd been employed with Discovery Village for uh, about two years, but unlike, you know, but like most, uh, uh, you know, especially individuals with disabilities, um, you know, she, she was furloughed in March, has not been back since. Uh, because it's a, a assisted living facility, they're, they're being uh, much more strict about who they bring back. So we don't even yet know um, what her return to work looks like. Um, so that's the, that's the reality. That's the, the reality that we're in today. We turn to the next slide. So we have to do better. I pulled some information from the, uh, pro, uh, the 2020 progress report on disability, national disability policy. Increasing disability employment is from the National Council on Disability, the NCD. Uh, we were fortunate to have Neil Romano at the Virginia Forum, um, our Virginia Ability Forum last year uh, participate. He's the uh, chair of the National Council on Disability. It's a it's a 124 page report, um, but I pulled a couple of things out out that you know on the positive side, um, you know there you know youth with disabilities expect to work, um, and um, you know after completing their education uh, and and you know provided they're able to continue that that education and there's some transition to the workplace. And now many companies um, see disability employment as a vital component. It's part of their diversity and inclusion, um, um, you know, uh, responsibilities in the organization. Probably more so, they see the strategic, um, you know, the, the um, how it affects their bottom line, improves their bottom line. Um, and I'm, I'm going to talk a little bit more about that in a minute. But sadly, uh, uh, and especially in today's unemployment. The labor force uh, participation rate is uh, well below people without uh, disabilities. Unemployment rate is uh, very high. And um, I think this statistic was, I believe, a couple of months ago, or it says August. Um, it's been even higher over the past six weeks. We're in double digits um, and have, have been that way for about six weeks. So just think about how much harder that has hit people with, dis um, with disabilities. Um, and there, even though we've made a lot of progress since the ADA, there's still um, people with disabilities are persistently locked out of employment. Um, there are disincentives and, um, you know, that we're not going to talk about today, but uh, we are going to focus on the other side of the equation, which is, um, I think, most important, that is employer um, engagement and involvement. Uh, one little nugget, since I work for the Federal Reserve, um, you probably want to know <laughs> where we're headed um, with uh, unemployment and the economic recovery. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it is a bit sobering. We get regular updates from our, our president, Tom Barkin, um, and uh, it's, it's a long road ahead of us. Um, you know, I, I, would, I would definitely, um, you know, do not listen to your, your favorite presidential candidate. Um, and, and the message that they are sharing, they are clearly imagining a, an economic recovery that is, that is not reality. Um, but do listen to Chairman Powell, uh, Chair of the Federal Reserve, um, listen to the Federal Reserve presidents uh, and the message coming out uh, from the Federal Reserve. Um, they'll give you a realistic picture of where we're heading, where we're headed, you know, both with unemployment and with our economic recovery. There is, there is definitely signs of hope. Um, but it's going to be a long recovery. So let's let's talk um, let's talk about um, what you can do. What you know? What can I do to make change happen from within my organization? Uh, and 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 we'll also cover a little bit about in your community. So. Um, before I jump into the employee resource groups topic, I did want to um, share some learnings from this week. I attended a national um, national organization on disability, the NOD, uh, annual forum on Wednesday, and there was some good information that uh, that was shared in that forum. Um, 
one related to employers mostly uh, was some quotes that I um, received or uh, uh, jotted down from um, Judy Human, who's a disability rights activist since the ADA. She has a book out called Being Human. Um, she spells her name H-E-U-M-A-N-N. Um, and I uh, can't wait to read the book, but she talked about employers have a long way to go. And, uh, you know, we've had the ADA around for 30 years and they're, they're still saying, you know, employers have a long way to go. Um, they need to look at people as assets at all people, all their employees as assets. They need to learn, listen, engage and invest. It doesn't happen overnight. So organizations need to be intentional. They need to make an investment and people with disabilities need to share their stories. But keep in mind, Judy's a, an activist. She's, uh, she's an extrovert. And one of the other panelists, you know, talked about um, with a disability, talked about how hard it was for her to even share her story with the organization she'd been employed with for a number of years. Um, and, and, and that's been my experience at the Federal Reserve. Even, even having an employee resource group in place over the past 10 years, it's still been difficult uh, for people to share their stories because of the perceived negative impact that that could have on their careers. Um, I'm, I'm hopeful, especially with uh, what we've been doing around social unrest and, dis and discrimination. Um, our bank has been um, uh, really, um, I think, driving people to share their stories in safe places. And uh, I hope that will eventually carry over uh, into the, the disability community and, um, and, and help, you know, again, changing that, that culture and that stigma that's still there today. Right, so this, you know, this has to change. Um, resource, employee resource groups, or we call ours employee resource networks, affinity groups, whatever you call them. Um, you know, why, why have these groups come together? I was, um, actually surprised to learn that they've been around since the 1960s. I didn't do a lot of research on the history, but um, I think the early groups were really driven by women in the work, workforce and also um, minorities, um, but mostly by women in the workforce. So there's, there's so much we can talk about. Um, I, you know, I wanted to really focus on what I feel are maybe the most important ingredients um, for employee resource groups and the way to drive change within your organization. So the first, the first question is, you know, what is the desired organizational impact? Um, to, to get started, um, we early on, we did an assessment really to see, you know, where where are we today? And, um, you know, because as you, as you look around your organization, you're thinking, gosh, there's so much we can do to change our organization, to change accessibility, to change our culture. So assessment is a great way to start. There's two, um, the Disability In, Disability Equality Index, the DEI is one, and the National Organization on Disability, the NOD Tracker Assessment is another, very similar. Um, the DEI, I think there is a fee there. Well, there is a fee with the DEI assessment. Um, the tracker is free. You can download either of them and use them to, as a guide to do your own self-assessment. Uh, we we uh, registered and did the tracker assessment with the NOD because we wanted to benchmark ourselves against other organizations. You can do that uh, by opting in or opting out. And what that means is um, you can opt in to be scored and uh, they and, and part of their reporting out, um, they don't provide, they don't report out any details, but they do report out sort of at, at a high level of results and um, kind of based on your, um, uh, what type of organization you're part of. Um, but we, we, we just, we opted out of doing that, um, but it, it's very beneficial to uh, um, look to see where we uh, stand with other organizations and then to focus on what are the things where we can have the biggest impact and begin to, um, you know, to just prioritize and say, these are the things where we really feel can make a difference. Um, and it, and it, it takes time. It's a journey. We're still working through the assessment. The first one we did was in 2017. We just did another one this year. 
um, build relationships and, and sense of community. It's, it's uh, you know, employee, employees really feel, um, you know, it's an affinity group. Uh, they, 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 you know, they get support um, out, of, out of a group and being able to share experiences, share their stories. It's a safe, safe place to share their stories. We focused early on with education and, um, and that also allowed us to sort of open that dialogue up across the bank. Um, so not just within our employee resource group, but we really wanted to, you know, bring the bank along, um, which is really the only way to change the culture. Um, build relationships and, um, sorry, we just talked about that one, um, driving change within the organization. Uh, this is the hardest, definitely the hardest, if you don't have executive support. And um, in the past 10 years, we've been in, in various places on that curve uh, where we've had very strong executive support, where we've had um, very little executive support, and, um, and it's challenging to make headway if you don't have that. Most employee resource groups have executive sponsors you know, that will help um, uh, drive change and, and be able to make decisions that will affect the organizations. Extremely important. The other, the other place to drive change is, you know, through partnerships. And we're gonna be talking more about partnerships, but, um, you know, don't try to figure it out on your own. Um, I, I first connected early on with, with Wes Seaton, you're gonna, uh, and you'll, you'll see why um, he's such a great resource with DARS. Uh, led me to other connections, led me to Virginia Ability. Uh, we also reached out early on to uh, the VCU Re Rehabilitation Research and Training Center, RRTC, um, to do some education. Um, there's, there's a lot more groups, and, and North Star does it. Holly does a phenomenal job with education and is, has spent some time in the Federal Reserve. Um, but those early relationships really helped us establish, you know, long lasting partnerships um, and resources in the Federal Reserve that, that generally, you know, don't, you know, they're there to help you. Um, there are consultants out there just as valuable, but, but um, you know, it's a great place to start and start, you know, we started with the Virginia departments of what I call, there's a whole slew of acronyms, uh, but all the agencies that support um, people with disabilities, hearing impaired, blind and visually impaired. Um, but as you'll soon learn, um, WES is a great place to start and can help you make those connections. Um, there's always a special ingredient and that special ingredient is, you know, it's not always um, uh, published in the recipe books, but do people with disabilities have a seat at the table? There was a great quote at the NOD forum that said, nothing about us without us. And um, that is, that is um, you know, that's something even I've learned along the way at one of our board meetings. Uh, I, I had just run across this app that I thought this is phenomenal for people um, who are deaf, deaf and hard of hearing. And so I shared it at our board meeting and uh, one of our community advisory council members who's deaf and hard of healing just looked at me and, with his interpreter and said, no, it's not a good app. <laughs> they, they, didn't have, uh, they didn't have people uh, deaf and hard of hearing people at the table when they designed that app. Uh, and he, he went on to explain you know, why it was um, really not um, you know, embraced by, by that community, right? So nothing about us without us. And then the last, uh, lastly, the professional development opportunities, uh, wherever you are in your organization, right? It's an opportunity to lead from where you are. Um, I've been in a number of different roles, but I will tell you the, the, the uh, for me over the past 10 years, it's, it's, it's led to a lot of new leadership opportunities, responsibilities, um, not, not only within my own organization, but um, outside my organization and, and allowed me to focus on the things that I'm truly passionate about. Um, so, um, so, you know, it's a chance, it's a chance to lead, um, to step up and, and speak out. Only, uh, before I go to the next uh, slide, just a few additional um, comments and I'm taking a quick time check here to make sure I'm still good. Um, just a few additional learnings from the NOD conference I wanted to share. Is your company brand inclusive of people with disabilities? And obviously, 
you know, companies that have a um, are for profit um, commercial companies, you'll you'll see advertisements. Not many with with people with disabilities, visible disabilities in the advertisement, but um, you know, the the uh, target. Charter Communications and uh, Facebook all participated and shared their stories at the NOD conference and um, truly take it to heart. So you, you know, you you know the companies that really have embraced this in their brand. For the Federal Reserve, we don't have anything to sell, right? But it's the brand is important because if we're not putting it out there, we're not attracting those individuals uh, to our jobs, uh, and we're not going to help, you know, um, change our culture within if we're not reaching those individuals. So the branding is is, is very important. Is accessibility part of your company's culture? Um, you know, uh, uh, I mentioned Target. Um, one of the things that they shared is they build accessibility into um, uh, all of their their digital um, access accessibility um, technologies. So for people shopping, you know, um, for instance, they have uh, uh, accessibility teams that come together and um, and and core to that are individuals with disabilities. Um, in the early in the design and it doesn't have to take time they do things in two week sprint cycles if you're familiar with agile um you know and, and especially in the commercial um space uh you know needing to turn things out quickly um and then the the last um one i want to share with you is does your company view accommodations as something that employees have to request or, or does your company practice um, design principles, university, universal design principles that make the workplace work for everyone? Um, and, and, and there is a distinction. And, and you know, I'll share, even at the Federal Reserve, I think we're, we're still going through a little bit of that, that shift in, you know, we're great at if an employee comes and needs an accessibility, we can meet those needs. But, um, you know, we don't do things um, universally that will support all employees, um, not just people with disabilities. So it, it definitely takes a, a, a mind shift, uh, that universal design principles mind shift in your organization. The uh, uh, Charter Communication uh, calls their uh, design, universal design process, they call it born accessible. All right, so let's talk about community partnerships and um, as a way to connect workforce talent with job opportunities. Um, so, uh, and here's where I'll get to uh, kind of wear my Virginia ability hat. Uh, you know, the good news for you is uh, this is a Virginia ability paid advertisement, but I'm not here to sell you anything. Um, I'm, I'm proud that North Star uh, not only serves on our, Holly not only serves on a community advisory council, but um, helps guide the organization, but uh, is also a, a sponsor of Virginia Ability. So we really appreciate their support and Holly's support. Um, uh, so that's my, that's my uh, disclaimer. Um, you know, we, we've talked a little bit about partnerships, but that's really what it's all about. Um, Virginia Ability uh, is about cultivating those partnerships and working with businesses and as a resource to make those connections to help, you know, to help drive home the message. Uh, at the Federal Reserve, our early involvement with Virginia Ability was, um, you know, helped us move, move the dial um, exponentially in terms of where we wanted to go. Um, you know, it was through those partnerships with Virginia Ability, with DARS, with North Star, with VCU and other, other organizations that we were able to start, you know, breaking down uh, employment barriers. Um, and barriers within our organization. Uh, and we started with, you know, we started with, um, we started small, we started with mentoring and career days. Uh, we hosted mock interviews. Um, you know, we reviewed resumes. We, we pulled others in our organization into that. So this wasn't just our employee resource groups doing all of this, you know, but we would reach out across the organization because we were able to share what, what are the things that we do at the Federal Reserve and, um, and, and allowing um, leadership across the bank to talk about what they do day to day and to, to engage in mock interviews. So it truly was, was impactful in changing the organization. You know, it led to job shadowing opportunities. We've done a lot with North Star. It led to op, uh, internships. We've had a regular rotation of internships. 
and um, and, and ultimately it led to um, part-time and full-time employment. So, um, but it's been a journey. You know, we've had to, we've had to work at that, um, and um, you know, we we couldn't have done it or made the headway without uh, you know without relying on those partnerships. So. Um, I'm you know, excited to, uh, to have been a part of that at the Federal Reserve, more excited to be a part of that with Virginia Ability um, and to be able to share some of that with you today. And I know that Wes is going to share some, some really great success stories with you. So I'm going to turn it over to Holly to introduce Wes. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. I'm, I'm excited to see you do that presentation live. We've been talking about all of these good strategies and tips for some time. And and thank you very much for sharing your experience and expertise with us. Um, I would add a plug for Virginia Ability. It has been an incredible opportunity to serve as North Star's representative on the community council there. If any of our participants um, listen to the story about employee resource networks and thought to themselves, but I work in a small business, maybe it's just me or maybe it's just me and 20 other people. We, we don't have employee resource networks. I would really encourage you to reach out to Virginia Ability or to a comparable organization in your community. And if you're not sure who that could be, shoot me an email and I will help you look it up. Um, Virginia Ability is a, a network of all different businesses who are all working on this together and can kind of serve the role of a little bit of an employee resource group in the community that connects those smaller and mid-sized organizations that may not have those networks within them. Um, if you're thinking about next steps for um, starting an ERN, there's some excellent resources online at our, at our um, resource slide at the end of this presentation. And also we have Bob's information available as we go through the slides. Um, and I know that he would be thrilled to support anyone who would be interested in reaching out. So thank you again, Bob. Yeah, thanks, Holly. I'm delighted to introduce our second speaker who is Wes Seaton. Wes has worked for many, many years at DARS, uh, the Department of Aging and Rehab Services. Uh, he works here in Virginia and he is the business site developer for the Central Virginia region. Um, he's been an incredible support of, supporter of North Star Career Academy and North Star in general uh, since we opened this program seven years ago. And so we thank him for his support. Um, he still regularly helps uh, all of our faculty here and our job coaches here network um, with businesses who could potentially employ our students. So he's still very much an active connection and um, supporter of North Star students and of people across Central Virginia who are seeking employment. So Wes has got quite a few very concrete tricks up his sleeve that he's gonna share with us now. And I will turn it over to you, Wes. Thank you for being here. Thanks, Holly. Um, so we talked about a lot today. Um, these are some tools and resources that we've developed based on the need. We talked about how are we gonna get individuals with disabilities employed and we talked about different ways. So one of the creative strategies that we did with this particular employer is we developed a boot camp, which was kind of like a way for them to register and then go and learn about the employer and then the, the uh, credentials that they can obtain. Um, so we did that last year. And I think if I'm not mistaken, Holly, didn't you send a student? Um, I think you guys yes, have we sure did. yeah so they were able to go and see if this is something they're interested in um and it's something that we developed uh with a small business so this was an example of a small business approach uh we opened it up to everybody in the disability community and they did uh, a weekend session to see uh to, just to see how it would go as far as their to aid in their recruitment um second slide <clears throat> This is an example of a larger one. This was Fariva, which is a pharmaceutical company. Uh, they're pretty large. And we started this with their manufacturing training program. And this was interesting because this was a relationship that took me, gosh, five years or so to uh, build. And we ended up getting uh, some students on the autism spectrum here. Um, and we ended up having to do sensitivity training for the hiring managers just to get them to better understand how to best work with individuals with disabilities. So that's been a good example uh, on a larger approach um, for an employer because they're a large employer. They've probably got about 1,500 employees. Um, the next slide, please. So you're probably asking yourself, how, how do we build these relationships? And one of the things that DARS started years ago was 
the Commonwealth Network, and there's a total of eight of them in the state. And so what we do prior to the uh, COVID is we would have employers come in and tell us about their onboard process. How, you know, um, and we would do those meetings monthly. So that's a good way if you're a small business owner or a medium sized company or large company to actually be able to recruit from a diverse talent pool. And that's how we market it. So the business managers for DARS run these across the state. Um, and that's one of the things that we're trying to do as business managers is individuals with disabilities to employers. So we're trying to be that link. Um, there's also going to be a slide with some um, tools and resources and some other things. But if you ever have questions about anything, you can always reach out to myself, Holly or, or uh, Bob directly. And some of the other things we're working on too is uh, job shadowing. Uh, February is job shadowing month. So we're working on that now. Holly's going to work with me. Uh, Virginia Ability is going to help sponsor some sessions for us. So we're working on that right now. So feel free to reach out to us if you have questions. All right. Thank you, Wes. I love all of that creative out of the box thinking. Um, I know that we have a lot of business owners and um, people who are in key leadership positions across Central Virginia who are really wondering about how to take those concrete next steps. And I don't know that I had ever heard of a business putting on a workshop before until we saw um, Commonwealth Curb Appeal take that approach. It was a two day workshop and that allowed that small business owner to just show a group of interested community members what his business did. Uh, one of our students was able to go and that meant by the end of the workshop, uh, that employer had had two days to get to know all of those interested applicants and he was able to pick and choose someone that he could potentially network with and recruit to be a, a candidate. In the meantime, everyone who wasn't recruited to be a candidate walked away with a credential if they earned it. So it was a really creative win-win. I'd like to draw attention to one more um, tool that's available to you. Uh, Virginia Ability does have a website where uh, if you are a business and you're trying to recruit uh, candidates for positions and you would like to diversify the pool of candidates that you recruit, um, Virginia Ability has a, a spot on their website where, where those things can be posted and you're welcome to reach out to Bob Lancaster to get more information about how exactly to go through the, log the logistics of posting that. So I'd like to thank again Bob and Wes um, North Star has had the benefit of their partnership and their support, and it has directly impacted in a positive way um, our students' growth and development. And I'd also like to pause for a few minutes and celebrate our additional many business partners. We're up to 50 some business partners that we have long-term relationships with. Um, not all of them are active every year, but we have so many people who come in and support our students. Uh, they support our school by working on our board of directors. Uh, they work on our North Star Career Academy committee. We have volunteers who come in and do practice interviews with our job. But most critically, we have businesses who open their doors and welcome and host our students for worksite experiences. And we find that this is one of the best ways to start building those relationships that leads to greater inclusive employment. And I am so proud to celebrate the sponsorships that we had that were active for 2019 and 2020. Some of these are long-term business partners. Some of them came on board in the weeks just before the COVID outbreak happened in our community and just before the governor shut down our school and, and had us go virtual last March. But I am so appreciative for all of them. Um, even some of them weren't able to host um, students on site because of COVID. However, there's a lot of work and development that goes into creating these partnerships and these work experiences, and they had invested the time and prioritized this um, as something that was a goal for their organization. And I just thank them so much. There, it, it would not be possible for our students to gain uh, the kind of experience and confidence and rich, authentic, real-world learning that they have when they're with the North Star Career Academy program without these partnerships. Uh, our students, um, for those of you who are not familiar with our program, uh, when, when we're not in a pandemic mode, um, our students are working with business partners at least once a week and some of them several times a week because the most authentic learning happens in the community, in the business culture space. 
So if you are interested in hosting our students, please reach out. We would be happy to bring you on board. So let's just take a few minutes to reflect on some of the concrete next steps that you can take if you're interested in making your organization, um, community organization or business more inclusive. One of the first things you can do is reach out to me or, or Wes will do this too. And when we will come out and, and we'll walk through your business. And I know right now a lot of people are working virtually and that's okay. We can do a virtual walkthrough of your business because what we'll do is we'll look through a different lens at the different functions and roles within your organization. And we'll try to pick out spots that would be good opportunities for supported employment or customized employment. Maybe some positions that have traditionally been structured in one way could be parsed and shared um, with different people doing different parts of the job or having positions shared between different people or maybe having certain duties that have been spread out amongst a number of different positions could be consolidated. And those kinds of customized positions would be an excellent entry point for someone who may be experiencing uh, challenges in another area um, for them to join your workplace. And we find that while it's a long road, and I think both Bob and Wes, and I would second this, um, we are in our seventh year of doing this and in our 25th year of being a school, it is a long road to making a workplace truly inclusive and accessible. However, every year we have benchmarks that we reach that are cause for wonderful celebration. This year, uh, we had a number of students complete successfully our program in the midst of the epidemic. And in spite of all of their challenges, we still had um, our, our 40 students earn 63 industry credentials. And so they are still entering the workforce equipped with skills that will make them very, very valuable employees. A second thing that I would invite you to do is try to identify other key people in your organization who are motivated to make this kind of partnership happen. Uh, ballpark, we typically find that if, if you just had a group of your employees together and said, hey, who, who's interested in maybe doing a worksite experience with some students who, who face some challenges, one out of three people will raise their hand. Some people will do it because they may have a disability themselves and it, it may be a less visible disability. Some people will do it because they may have a person in their life who is affected by this kind of a journey. And some people do it because maybe they've done it another place and they know how valuable it can be. And then of course, there are people who will do it because they just recognize the intrinsic value of having a more diverse workplace. So once you've in, uh, identified that key group of movers and shakers within your own organization, you wanna come up with a way to have them coalesce. Maybe that's around an employee resource network if you don't already have one or if you're a larger organization. But you could be a small company with 20 people. And if you've got three or four key people, have them come together and start thinking about what their vision would be to make their uh, place of business more inclusive. And then once you've got that group, a great next step is to connect with a community partner and North Star is happy to serve as one of these partners uh, and have some diversity training offered to those people. That is not always a community partner imparts uh, information to that group. Training is all about a conversation and understanding where people are and giving them a structured forum in which they can share their experiences and ideas and thoughts and journeys. And this is one of the times when the nothing about us without us becomes really critical where we want to make sure that um, people who are who are living a journey where they're, uh, they may have a disability, but they are really emphasizing the, the abilities and the contributions that they are making to the community. This is a great forum for them to make those contributions in the context of a diversity training. And then finally, a very concrete step would be to engage with a community partner who works with uh, people who have disabilities. And um, a lot of times those can be by providing internships or job shadowing experiences or other types of work experiences, like maybe supporting someone in a first job or maybe those can be events with that student body. Uh, every year, North Star has what we call our higher ability fair, which is a reverse job fair. So as employers, you can come in and you can meet our exiting candidates and you can learn all about the skills and wonderful abilities and fantastic personalities they could bring to your team and make your business more successful um, and more impactful in the community. 
So I just want to switch to the next slide, which uh, both Bob and Wes referenced. This is a resource slide. I would imagine it's a little bit hard to take notes from, but I will be emailing this PowerPoint out to everyone as soon as we finish the webinar. So thank you very much for being here. I'm just gonna pop back to this slide and invite Bob and Wes and Katie Hennekins, the North Star Career Academy Assistant Director, to come and join me on screen. And we're gonna take a, two, a few minutes just to address any comments or questions that may have popped up in the chat as we have moved through the presentation. Welcome, Katie. Hello, um, we have um, just a few questions in the chat to start with. Um, so the first is, um, are any um, hints for parents who want to advocate for their young ch adult children with disabilities? Well, I can I can maybe take that um, initially as a as a parent with a young adult with a disability uh, who's turning twenty six. The uh, being an advocate is is probably the most important thing you can do um, even with your young adult. It, you know, it's it's the role of the parent, um, and it's a lifetime role. Um, having said that, you know, our goal was to get her employed and independent. So, you know, there's, there's a balance. Um, we were fortunate to have a, a job coach at uh, Discovery Village who, who really helped get her on board. Um, but, um, you know, we, we needed to kind of back away and, and give her that level of independence and be an employee and no, you know, employees don't have their parents come to the job with them. But we did work to figure out key relationships and people who were advocates that um, one of her managers happened to have a, a sibling who had Down syndrome. And so we were able to determine and make some key relationships where we could just keep a check on how she was doing. And when she had a bad day and early on, trust me, she had a lot of bad days. Um, we were able to reach out to somebody and say, hey, you know, here, here's something going on in her life that you need to know about. So it's a little bit of a balance, but you know, they got They have to stand there on their own and you want them to be independent. Great, thank you. Um, at this point, there are no other questions in the chat, so we just invite anyone um, who is participating, feel free to put a question in the chat for our panel. And I would also add that um, that's actually perfect timing because we are almost exactly on time to go ahead and wrap up the webinar at 12.30. So if you hadn't put something in the chat and, and you have a question for us, um, when you get the um, emailed PowerPoint, you will have my contact information, Wes's and Bob's, and please feel free to reach out. Uh, relationship building is the key to all of this. Uh, networking and asking questions. And if I don't know an answer to something, I'm gonna see who I can find who does know the answer. And if I don't know the person, I'm gonna reach out to Bob and Wes. And one of them is going to know the person and, and we're gonna work on it until we find some sort of a, a resolution or direction. Um, this is a process. This is a long-term investment. We started by talking about imagining a world, reflecting on the fact that we've come 30 years. We're thinking about a whole next generation. Where are we gonna be in the next 30 years? So I can say for myself, and I think I speak for everyone on the screen right now, that we are committed for the long-term in making this happen. And we're just so grateful for all of you for joining us today or for streaming this webinar later when it is available on our website. And I thank you for your commitment to making inclusive employment for everyone. Thank you.